the meeting to order at 7.03 p.m. If we all can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <clears throat> Pledge allegiance to the flag, flag. United, States United States of America. Of America. To the republic, to the republic uh -huh. for which it stands, stands. One, nation, one nation under God, under God. indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Any public comment? Or did we receive any public comment? We have received none. Great. Like a motion to approve the minutes from the November 17, 2020 regular meeting. So moved. Motion by Pat, second by Bob Finley. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, there was a motion passes. Seven, any nays? Stains? Motion passes 7 0. For Sal Ekman's woman's report, uh, just a couple of things to go over. The police union contract has been signed. It was signed and dropped off in my office at 1230 Monday morning. Thank goodness that is done. Um, the ordinance meeting committee is constantly meeting um, and we'll be <coughs> updating the board of selectmen regularly. We'll be bringing different ordinance to the boards at least once a month to move forward and to go over. There are some in our packet to go over today. The police parking ban is in effect. It starts tonight. Parking is allowed on even side of the streets. Um, there are several roads that's not um, where the ban is in effect. So you're able to park on Bungie Court, only parking on the north side, Capricorn Drive, odd side parking only from Scoperette to North Star Drive. Farrell Street is odd side parking only. Grand Street is odd side parking across from Wood Street in the parking area. Humphrey Street is odd side parking from Washington Ave to James Street. New Street is exempt parking on both sides of the street. Second Ave, odd side parking only. Smith Street, odd side parking only. Washington from Grand Street North to Route 67, parking on odd side only. West Street, odd side parking only between number 63 to 77. And Woodside Avenue, odd side parking only. There is a $30 fine. The police department will start enforcing this after this weekend. And the, this parking ban is in effect from the first until March 31st, 2021. It's for the whole entire season. It doesn't matter if there's a storm or not. If it could be 50 degrees like it was today, the parking ban is still in place, okay? There's been several break-ins up on Nickel Mine. The police are advising residents not to take on the um, vigilantes and actually, you know, deal with yourself. Please call the police department and understand the Connecticut has a rule. It's a second chance rule. So they cannot by law chase people in cars or on foot or with dogs. Um, they are doing the best that they can, but on some situations, their hands are tied. Um, that is all I have for Select Women's Report. Item number six on the agenda is the annual report from the Strategic Planning Committee. I will turn it over to Kathy Verlick. Kathy? Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I know most of you, but for those uh, that I don't know, my name is Kathy Verlick, and I'm the chair of the Strategic Planning Committee. And the purpose of our presentation today is to take you through um, our activities for the year and to sort of uh, let you know what we're looking at for next year. So we have a deck where you want me to load it and share my screen or? Okay. I, I can do it too, if you want me to. I'm gonna go ahead. All right, so you're gonna be hearing from several of us, several of us tonight. Um, I'm going to start us off by trying to advance the slide. There we go. Um, introduce the rest of the commission. Um, again, I'm Kathy Berlick, I'm the chair. You're, I think you know everyone on this cast of characters. So um, for the record uh, with us tonight, we also have Rory Burke. Uh, Stefan Bohuniak, who you'll be hearing from later on, uh, Bob Finley, and Mr. Don Smith. So 
Today, the, the report is going to take you through a few things. Um, the elephant in the room, obviously, is the impact of COVID-19 on our planning process. Um, we've, we've learned a lot from what happened this year that we hope to carry over into next year and years beyond, and we'll take you through a little bit of that. Um, we're also going to let you know uh, the results of our 2020 planning cycle. So um, those of you who may recall, you saw us about this time last year where we set up the new way that we were going to be working on our goals. Um, out of that, we we're making some changes to our committee as a whole. Um, and we'll take you through what that's going to look like um, and sort of dive a little bit into the, me the methodology that we intend to use to make our process even more effective than it was this year. Um, I'll take you through the timeline for next year, give you an idea on sort of what our thinking is strategically and then our immediate next steps. So I'm going to go ahead and start right away by handing this off to Rory, who's going to uh, take you through a little bit of what the year and COVID-19 specifically has meant to our plan and the process. Rory? Sure. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so uh, the strategic planning, uh, as you guys may recall, if you were here last year, had developed a one-year plan um, of deliverables that were taken entirely from the existing 10-year plan. These were just uh, objectives that we thought could be accomplished within a one-year time span. Um, those were solidified in January. They were presented to the staff. Uh, we do a monthly senior staff meeting. Uh, and so they were presented at the February senior staff meeting. Uh, and the expectations were laid out that um, these deliverables were assigned to members of the senior staff who were expected to execute them over the course of the year and to provide progress updates along the way. Um, unfortunately, the March senior staff meeting uh, was the Monday of the week that we started planning the shutdown of the town for COVID. Uh, and so the next several months um, were focused almost entirely on COVID as the situation was uh, still new and, and changing rapidly. Uh, in the early fall, we reinstated the strategic planning updates during the uh, senior staff meetings. Um, and so unfortunately, the progress isn't what we had hoped for, but I think given the circumstances, that's perfectly understandable. Um, although not all of the goals were accomplished completely. Several of the deliverables were uh, completed uh, and almost all of them uh, saw pretty significant progress. Um, so I think, but for COVID, the one year plan would have been at, at least almost entirely accomplished. And that's, uh, is there anything else you'd like me to talk about, Kathy? Well, um, I think we can talk a little bit more specifically about the results that we saw. Um, if you can flip us to the next. Um, so, unfortunately, more than half of the goals were not finished, um, or there were a couple that were taken off of the the list because they were deemed no longer relevant or no longer completable. Um, but I think on the flip side, especially in light of the year, um, the fact that 48% of those goals were completed or they expect to be completed by the end of the year is something to be proud of. Um, you know, these were goals that were still completed in addition to having to deal with um, the obvious uh, challenges that the town had to uh, deal with. So personally, I'm pleased with these results. Obviously, would love to have stood here and said, hey, look, we got 100% completion, but I don't think 48% is too shabby. Uh, beyond that, I think we learned a lot. 
Um, you know, we've always been a very data driven group. Um, you know, if we can break it down into measurable uh, data, that's that's what we want to do. So I think coming out of this, we we learned, and I'm going to again toss this back to Rory, that we need to change the way we're thinking about this process. Um, you know, overall as an as a committee and as a town. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we've wrestled with um, the entire time that uh, we've been working on the strategic plan since its inception um, is, I guess, the kind of the feeling that things were more difficult than they should have been. Um, the process that we took was the seven members of the committee, now five, um, conducted stakeholder interviews with every department, committee, commission, board. We did a public input session. Um, we spent a lot of hours um, gathering data and formulating the plan. Um, I think it was an impressive undertaking, but as we hit the five year mark um, and look to recommence the process, um, it's pretty daunting for a largely volunteer board to do all of that work. And furthermore, the classic strategic planning process is usually driven by the members of the organization. Um, and while, you know, in municipal government, we have a lot of uh, boards that are participants in the governing process and they're, they're formed, you know, entirely of volunteers. Um, what was happening was the volunteers were interviewing the staff, taking their words, kind of reorganizing their words and then giving them back to the staff. And when the staff received them, um, sometimes they required clarification um, as to what we were looking for, despite the basis of the objectives being their own words. Um, and so the transition that we're, uh, we realize we need to make is from a board driven development process to a staff driven process. Um, what we would like to see is uh, the senior staff uh, developing objectives for themselves um, and then the strategic planning committee serving as a kind of oversight board, assisting the process, um, making sure that the staff's uh, objectives are, are rigorous enough um, and are in line with the overall objectives of the town. Um, that's, uh, I think that's what we're hoping to uh, see moving forward. Can you bounce this, this slide forward, Lori? Just go one more. Thanks. So, you know, as we, we looked at this and we talked about it, we felt that moving to this model um, would be basic, you know, as, as Rory just talked about, a better use of resources. Um, you know, Trish will remember, you know, and obviously most of the folks on our board will remember, it took us three years to conduct the first set of interviews. So to think that moving into every year we would need to, or into the next cycle, we would need to take three years to complete the interviews. And I think it's important to remember that that was three years with a commission that was larger than what we have now. So uh, we feel that this makes a lot of sense. And, and, and not only that, we feel like the internal teams have a better grasp on what's going on within their own organization. Um, you know, we, we look at very large picture and drill down to smaller details and break it down. But we really feel it's important to have that internal voice that, um, takes the lead on, on things that they see. I mean, 
they know their jobs better than anybody else. Additionally, though, when you move to this sort of a model, we're really empowering the internal staff to be to own their their role. And we're empowering them, you know, we're not we're not setting them adrift and saying here, hey, you do this, we're going to support them, we're going to give them oversight, we're going to teach them how to, um, to function in this way. And Stefan's going to talk a little bit about that in a minute about this culture shift that we're going to be looking to create. But we want to, we want to empower the internal staff to, to own their responsibility. And, you know, one of the really cool things about doing it this way is, you know, you can extend it even to, you know, personnel issues in, in, in HR development. You know, if you sit down at the beginning of your employee, employee year at your review and say, these are the X number of things that I'm going to accomplish, and you agree on those with your management, then when you get to the end of the year, you literally are working off the same sheet of music. And you know whether you've done those things or not. And you also open up a line of communication where if I have something on my task list that I'm that is being waylaid by other needs, i.e. COVID-19. Okay, I can't work on this stuff because I'm busy doing all these other things. I now have this dialogue set up and this opportunity to flag that right away rather than waiting till the end of the year and going, yeah, no, I just didn't do that. The other thing this does is it gives the town the opportunity to see hidden skills and, and hidden talents in your existing staff. You know, sometimes there's no need to go outside to look for treasure because you've already got treasure within your own house. So by formalizing this process, by empowering the team, we hope that we're not only going to create that sense of ownership and pride in their own work, Again, with support and oversight, but we're also going to be able to see, well, what else can these folks do? And I, I, I feel like you're probably going to be pleasantly surprised. So you want to go ahead and move us forward, Laura? Would you like me to talk through this for you or? Um, sure. Okay. So. So sort of to sum up what our role would be is we're going to be looking at training and onboarding, you know, creating this culture shift, supporting the stakeholders in their goal creation, providing ongoing support. You know, if they're having trouble, if they're not sure how to, to do this, will be a resource available to them. Zoom for all the wrinkles is a wonderful thing. You can drop and take a quick face-to-face -face meeting with somebody without leaving your, your living room. Um, we'll continue to report to the first selectman and the board of selectmen. We'll troubleshoot and course correct as we need to. And then we'll kind of meet with you at least once a year and let you know how we're doing. So, um, you know, that's sort of it in a nutshell. Now, Stefan, um, no, Stefan and Bob are both existing agile wizards. And if you were with us last year, you remember me talking a little bit about agile and as this was the approach that we were hoping to use. And then we did use this year to a degree to um, just to kick off this implementation process. So Stefan, I'm going, I'm going to ask Stefan to sort of take us through how everyone will be coached using agile as a methodology. Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, so we kind of touched on this a little bit, but you know, we were as a committee struggling with a way to make this plan actionable and you know make it something that we could utilize in the future in a serious way. Uh, you know, like Kathy said, Bob and myself and you know, Kathy, several of our members have experience working in an agile environment, and we've seen firsthand the benefit it provides. Uh, you know, so what we had was a document outlining dozens of goals that we wanted to accomplish over a ten-year span. You know, it's a lot to digest, and it actually threatens to render the plan completely useless when there's just so much um, information. 
So what we set out to do is break the plan down to smaller actionable chunks in an agile, agile world. These are sprints. Um, so we, you know, the, what needs to be done is prioritize everything in the plan uh, and then choose a chunk of work to be included in like the first, you know, iteration is what we call it. Um, so we agreed that one year increments were appropriate when dealing uh, with the nature of volunteer, a volunteer board and just sort of the necessary slow moving nature of like a municipality and municipal government. Um, so everything that we identified to pull in was determined that it should be actionable within a 12 month period. That's something that is always going to have to be the case. Um, any, anything that sounds big, right? So let's say we want to redevelop a piece of a piece of land, just as an example, that might not be something that's possible within a year, but there are parts of that that are possible within a year. Like, you know, you could do a, a study or, you know, you could hire someone to help with that. There, so we would focus on tasks that could be done within a year as a part of the bigger picture. Um, you know, anything that shouldn't, couldn't be in a year is could always be broken down. Uh, we, we've already seen some success with this method, as you've seen, even though it's, you know, conforms with the odd reality we're kind of facing here. Um, so the groundwork has been laid. The next step is the most important now. Uh, the teams that are actually responsible for getting this stuff done, uh, they need to embrace it and they need to take full ownership of these tasks. Uh, the best way to get these get anything done, in my opinion, is, is to have the people who are actually doing the work and are responsible for the work to actually really take ownership of it. Um, so the strategic plan as it exists is a living document. It's gonna continue to exist as a guide. We're gonna continue to be here to, to help and, and, and serve as you know consultants to the plan um help people add items to the plan as necessary uh, but ultimately it's up to those in positions to make change uh, to take on these initiatives and drive them to completion the agile approach allows the teams to set a goal for the year <clears throat> or whatever time period they choose if, if you know if we start working on this for a period of time and and the department heads come together and they say hey we want to break this down even further we could we could get more done if we break it down into quarters or months or whatever it is, um, that's great. And then you have regular touch points to track the, pro the progress. Uh, and you know, ultimately you're gonna review the body of work that's been accomplished at the end of the year or the end of the time period. Um, you know, the list of items that a certain team or individual is responsible for should be regularly prioritized with the most valuable and actionable items at the top. Um, you know, the success in implementing this plan will ultimately be at the mercy of the first selectmen, this board, and you know the department heads to promote the agility and not lose sight of the plan. Uh, in in our capacity as a volunteer board, we are more than happy to help with training and to to sit down with anybody who who might need some help uh, trying to figure out how to prioritize things or how to break things down into easier chunks or even how to get people on board um, with this approach. In in addition, we've um, you know, we've, we've created this simple dashboard that might be useful uh, in helping to track the progress on the completion of tasks. Um, so if you want, Rory, to, to kick over to the next slide, we can talk about that a little bit. So this is a sample dashboard um, that we've kind of put together, a lot of help uh, from Selectman Finley, who's, you know, kind of an expert in this area. Uh, so this, this dashboard is really simple. It's really something that a lot of people should be familiar with, or, or at least could be very easily understood. You know, essentially this is a place to regularly measure progress towards completion of our stated goals or the goals that are agreed upon. Uh, you know, in the spreadsheet that we've provided, team members can easily view the most recent status of every item in the one year increment and update it as necessary. Uh, at regular intervals, team members should get together to inspect where they are with their level of completion on each task. And collectively, this will provide a transparent picture of the status and allow for important conversations around, you know, the challenges and successes of, of the implementation. And this is something that could be discussed in, you know, performance evaluation or just discussed, you know, at, at a regular touch point. Um, so in terms of actually our role in helping you guys, I would probably defer more to Kathy on that, um, but we're certainly stand ready to help in any way possible. And if anybody has questions on any of that stuff, I'm happy to you know, talk through them or answer it. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Um, Rory, you wanna push our slide ahead for me? So I think, um, you know, Stefan and, and Rory's overviews lead us quite nicely into what we're looking at is the 2021 timeline. And this is where we're gonna to start to put everything that's in theory and in um, sort of an abstraction into 
into play. And like anything else in using agile methodology, um, it is malleable. And if we have to change things, we do. But you start somewhere, right? So what we're hoping to do is to start in January by coming back to you and saying, okay, well, look, you know what? We got to the end of December. This is where we shook out. And here's what, you know, everything that was finished, here's what we're carrying over. And, you know, here, here's our starting point. At the same time in January, what we'd like to do is, and, and ideally it'll be with all of the folks on this commission who um, are used to using Agile on a regular basis in their professional lives. Um, you know, as Stefan mentioned, you know, he and, and, and Bob are, um, you know, scrum masters and they, they know how to do this stuff from the top. I have the position of I'm more of a, um, of a hitman and that I go in and I do something and I get out or I work in, I have my own areas that, you know, I'm responsible. So I'm almost more like the internal team member. And, and we'll have that perspective and that insight as to what it is to work within these sorts of parameters. So I feel like, you know, and, and Rory has great, um, you know, academic understanding and understanding of the workings of town hall and, and Don just knows everything. So. Um, I, I was waiting for what you were gonna plug in there, Kath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting you out that easy. Um, so the hope is that whether it's through a series of Zoom meetings, um, we've started working on some materials that break down how to do this thing, um, you know, into some very simple and easy to relate to steps. Um, you know, Rory and, and, and others may have seen, you know, the analogy of baking a cake. If you want to bake a cake, you don't just take the pan and put it in the oven and cake comes out. There's stuff you have to do. And, this is the, it's the same thing. So January, we would really like to dive into getting everybody set up for their goal, you know, to create their goals. Ideally with people who've done it before, um, you know, right there beside them or across the screen from them, same thing. Um, we'll transition, we'll, we'll work that into February and hopefully by the end of February, we're going to have a good solid chunk of, of things to work on that have been already pre-vetted by the people who are gonna do them. So they have the opportunity to say, you know, eh, this is kind of impossible. Maybe we need to break this down. Or, you know what, I can do this plus. So if, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what we get coming out of the end of February. Um, once we clean that up, we'll come back to you in March and say, hey, this is what we're working on this year. And, um, bring you all along on the journey that we've, we've done with um, the internal teams. And then we move into spring and our first check-in with, with Amory, and, you know, she'll let us know how things are going. What do we need to fix? What do we need to adjust? What is the reports that's coming in from the, that are coming in from the folks? What's kind of be our eyes? Let us know what's going on. What do we need to change, adjust, fix, eliminate? Half year? We come in and say, okay, where are we thus far? What do we need to adjust? Do we need to fix anything? And then we keep going to the end of the year and the whole time we're tracking, we're watching, we're keeping an eye on what's going on. We're troubleshooting if we need to. We're providing additional training or support if it's needed. And hopefully we'll get to the end of 21 and we'll be able to sit here and have this meeting and tell you about a team that is on top of and has ownership in, of their own tasks and goals that are completing them, that are adding new things to the, to the list. And hopefully we'll be able to come back with a, you know, a far more successful um, list, you know, completion percentage than we, we have this year. Because hopefully we'll have moved along from this, this COVID thing. So that's the plan. Um, at this point, we can take any questions that you might have. And uh, that's all I got. Kathy, can I make one statement um, now that you were done? Yeah, as being a part of that board, I, I have to speak. Uh, 
I'm so proud of that board um, and lucky. I'm lucky to have joined it between the efforts that have happened between uh, what Trish, select woman Trish Stanka started and, and this board that's on, that's on this call. Uh, it's tremendous where they've gotten to, to this point and, um, and they're on the right track to start making this a part of Seymour's town culture. So it becomes a, a, a part of their planning process on a yearly basis. Um, you're right on the cusp of making it happen and all the things that Kathy rolled out there as, as a stepped plan is right at that point where it can truly be a part of the town culture. It can be a part of personal planning processes between the people that are working in the town and they'll see the results every year from the dashboard and just keeping track and keeping up with the progress that they're doing on those tasks. So I can't speak highly enough of where they are today, this board, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of that. Thank you, Kat. That was a great presentation. I know this board has come such a long way. And Trish, you must be very, very proud. I'm excited to see it reaching this step. This is why I left and kind of let some other people take over. This is what I envisioned I couldn't do. I don't have the background or specialty. So yay, thank you everybody. I, I think the four of you, Kathy, um, Bob, Stefan, and Don, you guys did an awesome job. Great presentation. I'm s I can't wait to see the next step that you guys take. I can't wait to the spring to see where we are. It's like, it's like watching your child grow, right? And awesome. Emory, if I may, it's uh, really important that you kind of be like the, the steward of this plan now um, as we transition it to the town, um, you know, kind of out of our hands as the, you know, the caretakers. We need that sort of organizational mindset that allows uh, these, these plans to flourish. And I think that you obviously embrace that and that's really nice. Um, and, and hopefully the rest of the board is, is on board as well. And the department heads, of course. Of course, absolutely. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> certainly something that has to be brought up you know, at regular senior staff meetings or department head meetings to, to stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say also, you know, as much as we're a resource for the internal staff. We're also a resource for you, Amory. I mean, you know, moving to this mindset is not something that everybody has had exposure to. I mean, honestly, you have, but you just don't know what it was called. Right. And, you know, sometimes just having somebody who can help you make sense of whether it's the jargon or sort of the way you think about things can mm -hmm. be can be very helpful. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Bob, I'm not afraid to ask. To help you. <laughs> I'm not afraid to ask for help, trust me. Awesome. But I agree. I, I'm so glad you guys will be there for support. I know Rory, you know, in our senior staff meetings, Rory follows us through. So, and I will be the uh, the champion for this, Stefan, and the steward for this and in, in, in showing that we're moving it forward and helping it grow. Thank you guys. All your hard work will not go to waste. Is there any questions for the board? Patrick Lombardi. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> Kathy, this is our uh, first meeting. Uh, I don't know you, but um, I just wanna say from your presentation tonight, I'm very impressed. Um, and I would certainly like to extend uh, thanks to you and your team and keep up the good work. Thank you. Privilege, thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for your presentation. With that, the next I'm gonna turn it over to uh, item number seven, discussion with Communication Commissioner Chair, Tom Amy. Tom? Good evening, everybody. So I guess the goal right now for everybody is to bring you up to snuff where our the board, your, your board of finance board and the gracious taxpayers are the 1.4 million we received for the bond issue. As of right now, we are, uh, just to give you a quick number, some 13,000 shy of the 1.4 million, but that's executed a lot. 
uh, all our mobile and portable radios across the board for all the departments that have come in. Uh, in the process of being engraved or installed, the fire department right now is at an 85% completion. Office of Emergency Management is at 50% completion. Fire Marshal's Office is at 50% per completion. EMS is at 65% completion. Uh, DPW, which was, they had three uh, radios on board. Those are completed. And the last to occur after everything is done is the flashing, it's a firmware update to all the police department portables, some 50 some odd portables. Uh, our mainframe stuff, the upgrades in the main system and a console, the console stuff is gonna occur in February. We had some COVID uh, delayed uh, occurrences that happened. Uh, the mainframe right now is starting to be staged and, and there's a lot of components to adding to our several receive sites and transmit sites around this town. So that's working on staging right now. Uh, the other real good thing is our next gen, which was our dispatch, our uh, commuter aided dispatch for the police department to replace their uh, aging system. That is up and running on the PD side right now. There's some deliverables that are still being processed uh, as what we call e-ticket machines that are being installed in the, in the cars. Two officers have been assigned with and doing a meticulous and excellent job in doing those installs. Uh, once that's up and running, we're looking at January's projected time. They will start looking at the fire and EMS side of next gen for dispatching to build that system out internally. That way we can turn around and, and be on our own if necessary across the board. Uh, with that, uh, again, my end goal is, is we've been looking at everything is in February, mid-February to end of February for the entire bond to be completed and the entire project to be up and, and running for everything. With that, I'll take any questions you folks may want. Anybody have any questions for Tom, Amy? You know, I just have a comment. Just, you know, as some of you are aware, I'm on the fire department and I happen to receive one of these new portable radios. And I must tell you that I have probably complained about radio transmission for the last 40 years, and I'm sure Tom will verify that because we have so many dead spots and bad areas in the town. Uh, we had a hazardous material incident here about two weeks ago down on the river and the gentleman I was standing with had his radio on and it was so clear. He was on Derby Avenue with me. It was so clear that I thought the incident commander was standing right next to me. So from a portable standpoint, um, much, much, much improvement and very, very badly needed. So my hat's off to the commission and to the board of chiefs. Anyone else have any comments or questions? No? Great. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, have Tom. Have a nice evening. Okay. Item number eight is a set public hearing to discuss the proposed ordinance changes for Wednesday, December 16th at 6.45 p.m. via the Zoom teleconference. In your packets, you will see that we have the, um, Aurora, you sent them over separately, correct? Correct, they would have gone out uh, late last night. Okay, so you see the, we have the uh, fire abatement A and fire abatement B, which is the abatement for those firefighters over the age of 65. You want to, did anybody get a chance to look at those? Yes. Okay. Is there any discussion? We, um, since we have everybody here from the ordinance committee, we can talk about it. I'm just pulling mine up. Okay, 
So on the volunteer firefighters, um, so as we, we always gave an abatement, right? We always had the firefighter abatement. And the firefighters had to make a certain amount of calls. They had to make a certain amount of meetings. They had to do a certain amount of community service. And the abatement that they received ranged anywhere from, I believe, $100 to $1,000. And what was happening is if they made the abatement, the money that the, the points they got, they, they raised went towards a certain amount of money. This, the chiefs, the captains would hand over to the chiefs the call sheets and everything else, and then it would go to the fire commissioners. The fire commissioners then would review it and the chair would take everything and submit it to the board of selectmen. And that is what we normally approve in the January meeting from the Seymour Fire Department, from Citizens, Great Hill, and the Ambulance Committee. The abatement was supposed to be going towards their taxes, the firefighters' taxes, car and property. They didn't have property, then it went to the car. Um, what had happened way back, uh, maybe 2018, Bob, about that time frame, Doug Thomas says we have to write, we cannot, we can no longer give them the abatement. We have, to, it was something with the W 2 forms and a 1099. And somehow we got away from giving them abatements to just writing them checks. So the, general, the Connecticut General State Statute, and Attorney LeClaire, correct me if I'm wrong on here and stop me if I'm incorrect, please. The Connecticut General State Statutes state that there is an abatement put in place for emergency personnel, but it is supposed to be an abatement towards their taxes. It is not supposed to be a check. So after the Ordinance Committee looked at this and we found out that it was wrong, we sat down with our fire commissioners and we said that this can't be the way it's doing. So now it is a pure abatement going towards your property tax. And if you have back taxes, you don't get the abatement, correct? The first select woman is exactly correct. Thank you. So what we did is we, as we were going through the Connecticut general state statute, we noticed that the state of Connecticut upped the abatement from 1,000 to 1,500 to 2,000. So we said, okay, we have to up the abatement. It's a Connecticut General State Statute, we have to follow it. So the maximum we're gonna give is 1500, but we're gonna to have to change it because the General State Statute goes up to 2000. The money is not like it's going to be where we're writing out the taxes, where we're writing out a check and handing it to little Timmy who lives in his mom's basement and getting a check is going towards their property tax. So the property tax is being paid. They're not getting a check and going out and doing whatever they want to do with it. So now we're going to take, we're, we're suggesting that the abatement go from 15, from I think it's $100 to $1,500, $1,500 being the maximum that they can receive. And it would go towards their property tax only if they're in good standing, meaning they have no delinquent taxes. If they have any delinquent taxes, they will not receive this. Correct? It's actually from a, from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. Thousand yes. to fifteen hundred dollars. Sorry. And you have to be current with your taxes. And we've also created, uh, in following the state statute, and there was a change made to the state statute allowing municipalities to also offer this tax uh, uh, rebate, uh, if you will, uh, to retired volunteers, someone who's over sixty-five. Uh, who's completed at least 25 years of service with either the Seymour Ambulance or Fire Department and continues to be active in some capacity as defined by one uh, or two of those uh, or either of those uh, groups. And they're entitled to that same, uh, that same benefit, mm -hmm. the same abatement. And Brian, just to, just to make a comment uh, that the state statute was going to go to 2000 as of next year, wasn't Correct. that? Case. That's correct. So the 15 up is to this year, and then next year they're actually going to increase it again. The state. Well, the state statute is this proposed ordinance doesn't. This goes to the 1500 and does not uh, increase it again to the 2000. Okay. I just want to make that clear. Right. Yep. You can go up to that amount. It's not mandatory. 
Correct. It's been 1500 for a while and, and the town has stayed at the uh, 1000 level. Right, that's right. Is there any questions on the fire abatement and the fire abatement for 65 plus? Al? You're on mute. I know, I know. So I guess the general intent, legislative intent here is to encourage that kind of volunteer service in your community with uh, fire or EMS. Um, Brian, is that basically what's going on here? So you give people, I don't think they need the incentive, but you're giving them a little bit of an incentive and almost a thank you for that kind of volunteer service because it is kind of, it is stressful, it is dangerous. I believe that was the intent of the uh, state legislature when they passed the enabling statute. Yes. And, and you would agree because on the holidays, you know, Thanksgiving is one of our, their busiest holidays where, you know, and we have, you know, emergency management director, Tom Amy on still, we can always ask him questions. Who's also one of the fire commissioners. We, they have house fires. So they're leaving their family on holidays. They're leaving their families in the middle of the night. They're leaving their families during the day. A $1,500 tax abatement to those that meet the point levels and to those that meet the criteria is much cheaper than us having a paid fire department. And remember, not all firefighters or ambulance or the volunteers get that $1,500 uh, tax abatement. Those are points that have to be earned by either attending drills, attending calls, attending meetings, and being part of the community, whether it's the Easter egg hunt, the steak and lobster dinner at uh, Citizens, the flower sale, they, they have to be also active in the community. Okay, thanks, sounds great. I'd just like to add one thing that $1,500 may not sound like a lot of money, but it's an excellent recruiting and retention tool for the fire department to use. So. It is. We said the 65, 25, we wanted to make specific that it was it, that it was for Seymour residents and Seymour residents only that served in the Seymour Fire Department. In other words, if you had lived in any previous town and had volunteer services, you couldn't use that towards this abatement. It had to be 25 years in the Seymour Fire Department service. Chris, you look like you have a question. Okay. Any, so any questions on the fire abatements? If not, I'd like to push that forward. Are you looking for a motion? Yeah. Uh, I, what's the date? 16th. I submit a motion to have a public hearing on the fire abatements, uh, ch the changes to the fire abatements portion of the, uh, oh, um, to push this forward for December 16th at 6.45 via Zoom. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Al Bruno. All in favor? Aye. All right. Motion Aye. carries six zero. No nays. Abstain, Madam. Oh, abs one abstention. I'm sorry, Patrick mm -hmm. Lombardi abstains. So it's two, three, five, zero, one. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. The next one, Rory. Do you want to take it from here on this one? Uh, sure, I can uh, discuss this. Um, Thank you. So basically, um, the ordinance committee is trying to go through the entire code of ordinances. If you have never looked at the code of ordinances, it's very long. Um, they're going section by section. They've tackled Article 2, uh, I'm sorry, Chapter 2, Article 2. Uh, which is various uh, boards, committees, and commissions. And so for, let's see, for the Committee on Aging, the Board of Ethics, 
and the Culture and Arts Commission. These are very small changes, mostly just to bring them to make minor clarifications and to bring them in line with the charter. The rest of these, um, so that is the Safety Commission, the Welfare Advisory Board, the Beautification Commission, the Employee Safety Commission, no, I'm sorry, not the Employee Safety Commission, um, and the Friends of the Broad Street Park Committee. Um, those are all being removed from the Code of Ordinances. These are, um, as we were reading through them, things that we only then learned existed. Um, and the rationale for removing them is just that most of uh, the language in these is that you know there shall be a five member um, commission um, and you know as as most of you know uh, we have a hard time recruiting people to participate in uh, municipal government and so having all of these required positions I mean if we had to staff them that alone is another you know 35 people that we need to recruit to sit on these commissions so um, what we had discussed because people for example uh, I think uh, Selectman Finley really liked the idea of a beautification commission. And so uh, rather than making it a requirement in the ordinances, uh, you know, you the selectmen can constitute a board without codifying it in the ordinances if you so choose. So, you know, that option is available to you. Um, and then finally, the uh, Employee Safety Commission, there are OSHA requirements for this commission to exist the OSHA uh, criteria were more stringent than what was in the ordinance. Uh, and so the ordinance is being changed to reflect the criteria set by OSHA. And that should be all of them. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Lombardi. On the Arts and Culture Commission, I noticed in reading the proposed ordinance change that we're reducing the number of members from seven to five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reasoning, I'm sure, is to maintain consistency with level appointed boards. Am I correct in assuming that? That is correct. We had passed, there's an, there was a, it passed, I think, a couple of years ago where we said, five members to a board, no more than that. Well, I don't remember that, but I do remember going through the charter revision process and Brian, you can uh, chum in anywhere you want to if you need be, but <clears throat> we had discussed this in depth um, during the charter revision process. And one of the things that we did was that the Culture and Arts Commission was both in the ordinance, in the existing ordinances at that time, as it is now, it was also in the charter. <clears throat> and we removed it from the charter. That was part of our, our cleanup receivable items, if you will. However, one of the board members had sent me a letter detailing okay, their activities that they perform during the year. And it was felt at that time that we would leave that for that commission, okay, at seven members. I'm just throwing it out there for what it's worth, folks. That's, it's neither here nor there. I mean, if you want to keep it at five, keep it at five. But I would just tell you that it was brought up at charter revision they did send us a letter, it was a very aggressive letter uh, detailing what they did throughout the year. And we felt that, um, yes, we would make an exception and leave it at seven. And again, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm, I'm thinking back to, I'm thinking back to that and I I remember I remember that discussion vaguely on the board but I think we said that we we're going to five and if they needed extra people to help then they can keep extra people to help but there was a reason why we kept everything at five that's fine
Any other questions? Chris Bowen? Yes. Um, could further work be done to codify some of the things that were removed, uh, some of the commission duties that were removed, like beautification? Could some of those duties be further written into the work of other commissions? In, in some of them, that we are finding that there's duplication in some of the other, um, some of the other committees that are there. And as we go through the ordinances and in the committees, that's we're we're saying, oh, it's here, so we'll leave it in here. We'll take it out there. You're you're on mute, Chris. There's things there that. Um, Ideally, could just be moved around a little bit onto you know, other commissions. But if there's mm -hmm. duplication, I'm just thinking that's something future, some future work that could be done because some of this is important. And yep. No, we agree. Right. Okay. We agree, and we don't want to take it out just to take it out. But if other boards are 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 doing, you know, are performing the same act, then it's it's silly to have it into another board. If you had read the EDC ordinance. Your head would spin because you know just the EDC ordinance had that the planning and zoning had to go to them. The inland wetlands had to go to them. This one they had to go. They had the right to go into manufacturers, and if someone had any hazardous waste or hazardous chemicals, they had to report to the EDC. Some of the wordings were so outdated, and and there's there's new regulatory agencies in that companies have to report to. So if it's used someplace else, if another committee is doing it or another commission is doing it, then we just removed it. Like our safety commission, like Rory says, OSHA has much more stringent rules and regulations than what was in the safety commission. So there was no need to have that in there. And we're just doing it to be in line with the charter. Um, so. Yeah, because we're still to this day right voting on EDC things that happened in 1982. So yeah. definitely understood on that. Any other questions? I mean, if culture and arts feels that they need seven people I guess we can leave it at seven people, but we're just trying to be in line with the charter. And if they need more help, they can ask more help, but I'll, I'll take the board's temperature on this one. If you feel that maybe we leave culture and arts at seven, then we leave it at seven. Isn't this something that the voters decided on? Uh, not, they don't vote on our, I think it's seven in the charter and five in our ordinance. Brian? I don't think we have it in the charter any longer, the arts and culture. Nope, taken out. Correct. No, we don't. That's correct. Brian, did we did we put a cap on the membership levels? That that's what I seem to recall for appointed boards. But maybe, someone take Chloe out. What, what I'm remembering now is maybe we culture and arts was exempt from that cap because they're no longer in the charter. That may be why. Uh, it was exempt, and then we decided to bring it in order with it now. Yeah, because it, you know, at the time it just didn't make place to have it in two places, if you will, in the charter and in the ordinance. I remember the same thing, Pat, being on the charter committee with you. I, I do remember that now that you're saying that. Yeah, my, uh, I, I, uh, as I recall, the, the discussion was during the ordinance committee meeting to bring um, the culture and arts committee in line with the charter cap, but I think uh, that was forgetting that they were exempt from the charter cap. Okay. We can leave it at seven. <coughs> Any other comments? No? 
Okay, so making the changes to that to make sure Brian has that. We're going to leave that at seven. You said. Yeah. I've got that. Thank you. So it changed the all arts and culture commissions to seven, not five. That was the only other change, correct? And as long as we're not omitting things that shouldn't be omitting, and we're ensuring that's being covered by other boards for Selectman Bowen's comments. Um, do we agree on moving these forward? And and Madam uh, Madam First Select Woman, there was one additional item you discussed in ordinance, and that was section 2-160. Dot one two one Division thirteen the Municipal Aquifer Protection Agency, which I think uh, you want to send that as well. That was the uh, included yes. in the material sent by Roy. That just uh, clarified that it is not the DEP; it's the DEEP. But that should also Correct. be sent to make that technical Correct. correction. Yes. So Any Amber, are you, go ahead. Are you for a motion to. And culverts, everything under chapter two, or did you want to do them individually? I think those are not all of the sections. I don't believe. Uh, yeah. Let me see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven eight. eight. I think those are all the sections. Yeah, you can do them as one motion. To, yeah. you know, read them as one motion. You, you do not need a separate motion for all of them. That, that is my question. Thank you, Ryan. You, no, you do not, Pat. Can I have a motion to accept char charter chapter two, article twos, sections one through eight with the changes moved by uh, motion by Patrick Lombardi, second by Bob Finley, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries six zero. Okay. Item number nine, discussion and take possible action regarding the economic development director. Do, do, do. So in your packet, you have, we had attached um, some information that Karen from the Economic Development Commission sent over. First one's an Economic Development Commission recommendation, recommendations for the Economic Development section of the Town Strategic Plan. This was a second draft in December 2019. I'm going to guess that this Bob Finley was sent over to the Strategic Planning Committee. What's that? I'm sorry, Emory. Was uh was this sent over for the the strategic planning committee to look? So it says town strategic plan. I don't believe that it was. Okay. So I guess we can look at it and to see if this is what we wish to send over. Chris. So what exactly are we deciding to do with this? Because I've got several this questions. Is, this is what the, the economic development uh, Karen sent over to us. So she sent us this. She sent us the, uh, the task list for the director of the economic development, uh, what the 2021 task list is. And I thought I had... So I thought she, there was a separate email with the job description. description. So, okay. Job description. Second which I was going to ask if that was the old one or the new one. Oh, that was a new one. Okay. Because one of the first things that I see in this um, town strategic plan thing is explore ways under the goal of exploring ways to promote desirable types of development in Seymour. <laughs> Ensure that the Planning and Zoning Commission continually updates the zoning regulations to facilitate appropriate development. That does not seem to be, and that we're just starting off here. Uh, that just that does not seem to be an appropriate role for an appointed commission to determine how an elected board does their job. Now, I agree with the ultimate goal, uh, which you know I had some small hand in when I was on planning and zoning, but that's not their. It's not their job to have that codified in the strategic plan. It's not their call. They can. They can advocate all they want, but to have that put in their description is beyond the pale for me. 
And that's just as I go down the list. I mean, it's I understand what they're trying to pull off here, but a lot of this is not applicable. And it's also completely different from what's in the strategic plan, which I just looked at a few minutes ago. Well, and that's why we said if you had actually looked at what the economic, the EDC's uh, role was in the ordinance, you would, you would, you'd be surprised. Mine was encourage more frequent engagement with and visitation of local businesses by municipal staff and electric. We have a boss there, and that's the voted elected officials. We we do talk to people. That's why we get elected. Um, that's not. EDCs, that seems to be overbroad for what the Economic Development Commission should be. But remember, the EDC is an advisory to the planning and zoning, so they can make recommendations that will facilitate economic development. So can I okay. ask one? Some, of the, some of the wording has to be changed then. Uh -huh. before, before we go any further, it says second draft 12, 17, 19. Was uh -huh. this given to... to was this given to someone on 12, 17, 19? I, I, I gotta make sure I understand. Was this, did she just give this to you to identify what was done in the past or is this what's been proposed? I'm, I'm kind of- I wanna torn. say this is what they're proposing. And this is why I was kind of hoping to get, I would like for us to review this, um, look at it over and, and have a meeting with them. Okay, because this is like a year old, if, if, and I'm, I'm assuming maybe they've done something more recent, or? Not only that, but I was at the December meeting, and it wasn't a meeting where something like this was discussed. It was just a, um, like a round table of, um, business, of business owners in town. Uh, so there was no actual meeting. It was just basically a powwow. These were, these were documents that um, Karen Robinson, the vice chair and acting chair uh, of EDC gave to Anne Marie uh, when they met. Um, if, if you guys will recall last year, um, you know, EDC's recommendation uh, to move forward with, with Sheila O'Malley was put forth in 2019. Um, and then there was some back and forth from this board um, regarding, you know, we would like to see a more specific list of tasks. You know, what is it that the economic development director would be doing? And so I think that's what this list of tasks is. Um, the, the job description was provided to them. I, I don't know that it, it was changed. So this was just the existing job description as far as I know, going back to when Fred Missouri was economic development director. So, so Rory, just to rephrase this, so I, I'm, I'm understanding. So this is supposed to be what the EDC director would drive, not the committee? If, if I understand, because that's what, what was asked for. Um, okay. when, they, when they put forward the recommendation, you know, the, the general consensus was, you know, so what, what's different, you know, if we didn't like what was going on before, what's going to be different? What is this person going to be pursuing? Um, and so we asked for some, you guys asked for some more specific guidance uh, from the EDC. Oh, so they haven't, but they haven't touched it since last year. This is whatever the same document that was last year. So I've got, for comparison's sake, just, just for giggles, um, I've got the economic health section, pillar three, section B of the uh, strategic plan here. So what they did was they took this and made quite a few changes and word changes. Now, none of this work here that you're seeing on your screens now was done last year. Uh, I know that for a fact. But they have been trying to codify the role of the economic development director um to try to get a more amenable person into that role but i can tell you that they did not recommend sheila in 2019 i can tell you that for a fact they did recommend her earlier this year but not in 19. i i think it was 2019 chris because we stopped meeting in march because of covid and it was january february time frame where where we had that meeting and i have to go back into the minutes where we had the meetings where we said that we would we would be the search we were not going to have kurt part of it 
I was going to lead it. And we as a board were going to, to speak to her. But it was January, February timeframe that it finally came to the board of selectmen. So I want to say it was maybe the end of 2019. It was not 2019 for sure. I was the vice chair of that commission until November when I got elected to this board. That's when we voted Karen on. And I was at the December meeting before resigning from the board fully. Um, if something like that would have happened, uh, I definitely would remember it. We did have Sheila talk to us in 2018, but we did, they did not put Sheila forward in, during 2019. I can tell you that 100%. But I think we're getting a little bit off into the weeds here. Um, there's enough in this strategic plan edit that mm -hmm. first off, they probably needed to they probably need to send it to the strategic planning committee. I don't know does if anyone thinks I'm off board there, please let yeah, me know. Yeah, no. So yeah, the way this would work, Chris, this would go to strat plan committee, and really, um, if there was an economic development director, this could be utilized as some. Um, some of building his personal plan and what could be put into the strat plan. So that would be the intention of probably the document they had to provide. We, they don't, you know, they, we don't have to follow this by the letter of law. This would be whoever has to own the tasks to be able to put that in the strat plan. Um, that would be the goal. Um, in lieu of that, and, and Anne Marie, you know, that's something maybe in lieu of having the economic development direct director this would be something that you might have to review to see what you'd want to put in the strap plan for next year until a, a economic development director is appointed. That would be the, that's the intention of the strap plan that, mm -hmm. and, and again, some of these wouldn't be things that you might do next year, but you, you might have some of the items that are in here you want to accomplish within next year's str strategic plan. Right, because not only that, but um, I see the job description, and this is a very nice looking document, but I want to I want to put out into the record the whole reason why I even brought up the whole idea of an economic development director was so that we could consider moving to a different type of position, a more full time position after COVID. I want to make clear that we have financial responsibilities due to the virus that take precedent now, and the economic mm -hmm. development director's role, their salary line, thirty five thousand dollars was put into the discretionary budget, meaning it doesn't move until both boards vote. So we're kind of putting the cart before the horse on this. And I kind of want to pump the brakes a little bit. This is definitely something I think should be accomplished. I've been very public about that for a couple of years, but we need to pump the brakes on the whole economic development director role until we get past this pandemic. So no, I think I there's some processes that have to go forward with the strategic plan and the economic development commission then when we know what our financials look like, then we can start talking about bringing on bodies. Yeah, and Chris, just to add to that, just so um, something like this, you'd still want to have actions in the strap plan, regardless of whether, or regardless of whether you have an EDC director or not, so that when they're hired, you already have something that you create a personal plan from. So right. it's, it's more strategic, it's more of a kind of a, longer term strategic approach over the course of the year, you may or may not meet all those tasks, but it's it's a part of the plan, it's a part of the vision, right? And then when the EDC director comes aboard, they're given that plan and said, these are the tasks that we're, we're targeting for FY21. Right. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, definitely. I just think more work has to be done on this draft. Agreed. I agree. Yep. Ready for Agreed. any kind of pop, any kind of prime time. So I think we're all in agreement on the um, hiring an economic development director until after this pandemic is over, correct? Definitely, yes. Definitely, I really just wanted it on radars. I just have a question regarding your job description. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can someone tell me when this job description was written? No, it's a rhetorical question. You can't answer it. You know why you can't answer it? Because it's right. not dated. Right. Any job description that we have in this town, whether it be for the economic development director, he or she, whether it be for the public works director or it's whoever dated. it is, the job description should be dated. You date the, do, you date 
the job description because it's really a footprint, okay? It's, a, it's etched in stone, but it's really not etched in stone. And you may want to make revisions or additions, okay? Or the individual that may be assuming that position in the case of the economic dire <coughs> development director may say, yeah, geez, I went through this step, job description. I understand it, but it doesn't have A, B, C, or X, Y, Z. So I think moving forward that any job description that's written, okay, number one, just for the sake of litigation purposes, okay, it should be dated. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Yeah, this definitely, this didn't go through Pelosi anyway, so it's. No, it didn't. Al, do you have a question? I was just going to piggyback on what Pat said. I think it's just a good idea anyway, just for organizational purposes, which I think what Pat is getting at, it should always say, have a drafted date. And if it's a, a living document that's going to be changed and we're going to keep referring to, you then might want to say, you know, drafted X date, updated Y date. And when it's updated again, you add, you tack on a semicolon, update it again. So you have a little running tab at the top of that document and you know exactly what's going on. And that's something that used to happen at my old agency that a colleague and I kind of pushed. And it really does help because then you know how old it is. You know, when you started it, you know, when it's getting stale and needed to be done a year ago, uh, when you last touched it, did a committee touch it? You know, who did it? Did Al do it? Did Bob do it? Did Amory do it? Did Chris do it? I mean, it, you just have to know who, who touched it. I think it's just a good habit to get into just for organizational purposes. And I, and I think, Pat, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that's what Pat's getting at. Like, we, we know like how old this thing is. If this is a 20-year-old document, well, then it's high time to update it and move it along or you know, get rid of it, potentially, like start afresh. So it's just, just a good, good practice to get in. I, I, I think it's nice to know the history of the document. You hit the nail right on the head, and the you know the other thing is is revisions to it uh, when it's drafted, approval, who approved it, right? Those are all important things. And, you know, again, Al, you hit the nail right on the head, and it's it's part of organization and moving forward. Um, we need to be cognizant of this, and we need to pay a little more attention to those kind of small details. No, and I agree. And I think, you know, we would, now that we have an HR director, HR manager, we would have him review and make sure that it's all within the right form, the dates there, revision dates there, and everything is on file. And it's what we're looking for. I think, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, is that this was a task list. This was a list that was given to the person that was there um, after, I forgot her name, after Fred Masori, but she was, we shared her with the cog, Rory. It was uh, Sadie. Sadie. So this might, it may have been a task list that they had for her or she had put together or something i don't i don't this is not a job description it's a task list yeah that's where i was gonna head it's not a job description anything yeah. that you do by a job description would have to go through pelosi you know hr yeah. so that it's formally done through the town of seymour so i need to step away for just a second so but is there any other questions on, on, on this? I think we're agreeing that we're going to hold off on hiring the, an economic development director, you know, until after COVID. I think that, you know, I think we all in agreement with that. I think what we needed to do was get what the EDC had and put it in front of us to see what they were looking at, to see what they were thinking, and then just come together as a board and meet with them and put things together and let them know where we stand as a board. Rob, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, can I make a recommendation? Um, e even though we're going to hold off on the hiring, I'd like to 
make sure that we have a, a formalized job description mm -hmm. through HR um, that has all the, that we should all review before it goes out. So we're prepared so that we're not waiting on that once we make our, you know, we nod our heads and say, okay, let's go get them. Now we got to go do their job. Let's, let's do some stuff pre you know, preemptively um, to get prepared. And, and then let's put a timeline of when we re revisit, revisit it again, because we're saying after COVID, I don't know if we all know what that means, right? I mean, no. I, I think while I understand that we do have to, we have to kind of hold back on the budget a little bit, I, I think at some point we're going to have to make a business decision on if we want to have someone take on that role, and it might even still be during a COVID period, um, that we, we hire somebody to do that. Um, I agree. So we should probably put a, a time band around how long we want to wait. Maybe we say we're going to revisit this in January or, or what have you, or, and then we make that decision then, but into the time being. So we got the holidays coming and it would be hard for us to even consider hiring anybody at this point, but we should be prepared for when we, we, um, when we say go that we're off and running. So do I have a motion then to maybe have Chris Pelosi uh, put together a job description for an economic director? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries 6-0. Um, and then we will- Who made the motion? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Chris Bowen made the motion, Bob Finley. Second, I'm sorry. Well, actually, Bob Finley made the motion and yeah, it was Chris reversed. seconded it. Correct. Reversed it. Sorry. Yep. Thank, Thank you, Al. You. Yep. <laughs> then we'll revisit this come J January. I don't think it's something that we want to put on hold because we want to continue to move our town forward yep. and continue building it. But with the holiday going on, and you know, Chris, you had stepped away, but we said we never know when COVID is going to be over. You know, what is a definition of COVID being over, right? Yeah. Going back to normality. So okay. we'll have Chris Pelosi write a job description for this. I think we said this is more information was more to formalize the role. You know, even if we want to wait, it's part-time, full-time. Um, and are they going to be doing these tasks? So something to look at. Okay. Next on the agenda is Appointments. Appointments. We have Paul Wedowitz, Open Burn Official. We'll just do all the appointments at once. Paul Wedowitz for the Open Burn Official. His appointment is for one year and it ends 12 1 2021. Tom Aby, Open Burn Official. It's a reappointment for one year. His term ends 12 1 2021. Tim Willis, open burn official to reappointment, one year, 12-1-2001 for an expiration date. Leanne McMurray, person memorial, reappointment one year, expires 12-1-2021. Veronica Hoffman, per Pearson memorial, reappointment one year, December 1st, 2021. And I have a motion to accept these appointments. So moved. Moved by Bob Finley, second by Pat Lombardi. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 6-0. Next in your transfers, we have no transfers. Correspondence is the check run. Do we do the tax refund? I don't have any tax refunds. There's no tax refunds and abatements in here. I don't Yeah, there the tax collector had none. Had none. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh sorry, thank you. Is there any worry? Did anybody come in for public comment? I have received none. Okay. Uh, selectman's comment, Pat Lombardi. Happy birthday, Trish. 
<laughs> How the hell did you find that out? Oh my. Oh, we know everything. <laughs> Have our sources. I'm a little Promise. scared. Okay. Trish Danka, Selectman Commons. Um, I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. Um, we've got Alex has, sorry, the parade committee has 25 signups for the lights uh, competition this year, which I think is nice community involvement. Uh, I know he's excited about that. And hmm, I just hope everybody continues to stay safe, watch the numbers, do what you're supposed to do. Um, I know we all have different opinions about the pandemic, but I mean, for sure, it's an unprecedented year. And as we watch the numbers rise, I just want to make sure Seymour's community stays healthy and as safe as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Finley. I just want to say happy birthday to Trish. I was excited to hear it. Um, you know, to get, to get into your 30s is, is a great time. <laughs> 29, 29. <laughs> I have another year to go to reach 30s. No, and, and I wanted to shout out for the parade committee. I, I just see, you know, that light, the lights thing is going very well. And I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, and to have everybody stay safe now that the holidays are upon us. So, Christopher Bowen. First off, congratulations to Select Woman Danka on behalf of myself and my friend and colleague, Mr. Van Egan, who could not attend this meeting today. So happy birthday, Trish. Um, the virus does not know that it's the holidays. Mm. Be safe, stay home if you have, stay home if you can, wear a mask in public, wash your hands, do all the things that we've been told to do since February, really. Um, it's gonna sound morbidly cheeky, but we don't want a white sheet Christmas the virus does not care. And it is, I know multiple people that have died from this virus. It's horrible. It does not screw around. Please be safe and don't take any chances if you can help it. I, I, I don't know what else to say. Thank you, Chris. Al Verno. Uh, just happy birthday to Trish. Hope you have a relaxing day. Maybe Alex make you a cake. Wait on you for once, right? Um, hope everyone had a relaxing Thanksgiving and I just wanna echo the comments. I know that we're being very vigilant as a town with uh, COVID and the pandemic. Hopefully, you know, there's a vaccine on the horizon and things can loosen up in the spring, but they're saying it's gonna be a very difficult winter. Uh, it looks like we have people are, are taking it more seriously, thankfully, and that, um, you know, we just have to keep encouraging folks to do the right thing and lead by example. So I think that's very important. But other than that, um, it's good to see you all. And that's all I have, Amory. Awesome. Um, on mine, I just want to say happy birthday, Trish. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And Monday is a resting day for you. Um, COVID-19, it's, it's, uh, we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know where we're going to be. All we can do is stay vigilant, wear your mask, wash your hands, and stay safe. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And I look forward to the holidays. I look forward to this light displays. I see that we had, I think Alex says there was almost 19 people 25 25 now see oh wait i want to back up we drove by jean sosnovich's house in Beacon. oh Beacon. yes gonna get an honorable mention on the website because that's a drive-by awesome you're gonna have to share her address with us so we can all drive by jean's house yes we did say we're gonna give her an honorable mention even though she's really not in seymour but she's from seymour in the heart right well she lived she lived in Beacon falls but she's from seymour Anyways, um, happy birthday. Can't wait for the light competition. Stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, be safe. Can I have a motion to motion adjourn? To motion to adjourn. Sorry, Chris, Trish beat you. 
Sorry, I should. I didn't know he was singing tonight. Are you lucky he didn't sing "Happy Birthday" to you? Motion by Trish, second by Chris Bowman. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night.